Good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please for introduce to you today, Sergeant Ryan Rogers of Third Battalion, Second Marines. I believe you went from three six to three two. Am I correct, Ryan? Uh, other way around, three two to three six. Three two to three six. My bad. Yep. Uh, well, well, thanks for uh, coming on the show today, bro. Yeah, absolutely, man. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. So, me and Doc kind of traversed through a couple of your things, and. Um, you know, it's just awesome to see another veteran doing his thing in the social media world, bro. Um, I see you hooking and jabbing yeah. out there. And uh, the last uh, one I watched was Combat Story. And that that just hit hit me in a lot of places that um, I haven't gone to in a while. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, once again, great to see you doing your thing out there, man. Yeah, uh, man, I appreciate it. And, and likewise, it's, um, you know, the war, the war essentially for now is over. Of course, we're going to have another one. But... For now, it's, you know, there's a community of people that's not getting much larger than it is now. And we can only relate to each other in some aspects. Um, and I'm not saying all aspects because, I you know, I think there's a place for doctors and there's a place for, you know, recovery medication and things of that nature. But for the most part, we got to band together because we have something that other people don't have in it. Um, so, yeah, man, I, I love seeing you guys' stuff as well. I, I like your show. Ryan Fugit makes it really, really easy on combat story. He's a good interviewer and um, he's got some, he's got some, you know, just some, some big hitters on there that, that oh, yeah. you could <laughs> really take some information from. So what's his, uh, uh, what's his background? So he's a helicopter pilot. Actually I did, I interviewed him. I'll have him coming out on my show uh, shortly you know, within the next couple of weeks. And he was a helicopter pilot, Apache pilot. And then uh, I think he did some, um some work with the cia as well afterwards oh, wow. yeah. um operational work you know um and then i got it he you know he also does a silicon valley like netflix um uh internet security and and things of that oh, nature wow. that'll be on nice the show I, I talked to him a little bit about it at the end just to kind of see you know where he's at now and I was blown away, man. His resume and the the connections and network that he has is is amazing. Heavy shit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah he's, so, he's he's definitely fucking he's definitely fucking paid his price. You know, he he, he has a dog in the fight for sure. Absolutely. So, uh, Ryan, if you don't mind me asking you, how did you? Uh, I don't know. I look at you and I just see you remind me of a lot of people that brought me up in the Marines, dude. Very Type <laughs> A personality, sledgehammer. How, how did you? Uh, How'd you get into the social media game, brother? Uh, for example, me, I uh, actually I don't even know how the fuck I got into it. It was just uh, <laughs> kind of a coincidence, man. I kind of just got pushed into it. But um, yeah, if you don't mind me telling, asking you, how'd you how'd you get into it? Are you referring to like influencing in general? Yeah, yeah, man. So <clears throat> I mean, most of it's just just that my career came to an end before I wanted it to. I had some brain damage and uh, it was it was messing with me and and, and rightfully so I, I began to have seizures. You know, I didn't advertise that to, you know, to the world, but I was having tremors and seizures. And um, and finally, the Marine Corps kind of said, you know, enough's enough. And until that point, I had, you know, Facebook, I, you know, I didn't mess with it. I wasn't ever on it. I'm not, you know, um, at that time, I influenced Marines and Marines influenced me. And that was my world. Um and so when I got out, I had this, you know, I think we talked about it, you know, offline, I had that lack of purpose and that lack of, you know, serving a higher power than self. And, you know, I, I just sat myself down after a couple of years of, 
you know, odds and ends and building houses with some buddies and putting floors in and things of that nature. And it's just like, didn't fill that void. And I'm not a depressed guy, you know, as all the things that I've been through, I don't like, I'm not hopeless. I'm not depressed. I still impact my community best I can. Uh, but that I couldn't fill that, that void, you know, that, that uh, higher than self void is, is what I've kind of figured out after going to school. But you know, after spinning for a while and losing things and making poor decisions, um, just mainly out of anger because I felt like I could still lead a squad and my ears were fine and that kind of thing. Um, but after a while, it was just like, okay, guess what, dude? You have seizures now. You'd be a detriment to a squad. Face it. Okay, check. Now, now I feel better there. But now I have to do something. Like I can't. I'm. You, you retired me at 34. I, I'm. I'm, I work. That's not retired is not in yep. a, you know, vocabulary yep. really, you yeah. know, a, a, as far as like in reality for me. And so I thought about it, you know, that then and there, what do I want to do? I want to impact my community, the war fighting community of all branches and, and, and all countries. I don't really care who it is. All of us that have fought somewhere have a special bond, you know, of serving in that ultimate arena and trying yourself. And I wanted to impact those people. And so I figured I could write and impact them. I could speak and impact them. Those are the two things I focused on. And so I wrote a book uh, about my last deployment in Marja in 2010. And then after I wrote the book, um, I landed my first couple of speaking gigs over on Camp Lejeune talking, you know, giving uh, keynote speeches over to um and to the infantry battalions the victory units over in on lejeune um and then i had one one young sergeant called me up and wanted me to come and review some of the book with his squad that was the six marines uh squad leader and i got to you know i i was fortunate enough to be able to go do that and it was like um if you ever had that emotion that just comes over your body where you're just almost tingling it's almost like you're high on whatever that emotion or that sensation is because you're right exactly yeah. where you're fucking supposed to be. I got that. And once I got a little bit of dose of that, it was like, Nope, I got to do, I got to do this all the time. And I don't even yeah. like social media. If I'd be honest with you, I don't mess with it. My partner messes, you know, my, 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 my a slash messes with my <laughs> social media. I have a kid, uh, another uh, Zach Thurston's uh, my social media manager for my, podcast and he does phenomenal work for me so that i don't have to be inundated with the comments and the likes or the not like stuff you know i just stay away from it yep yeah that's but it is but me. i would say it is imperative if you're a startup or a growing platform or company it's imperative that you're on a digital world that's where yeah, everything is definitely know so, it is yeah 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 so, so that, that whole period right there man. man go ahead doc go ahead if you don't mind me asking, Ryan, fucking, um, so I was 29 and I started having seizures. I'm 36 now. When did yours start? And like, when did you like dive into that? Like, you know, the treatment side of it all, like, you know, like, okay, why the fuck is this happening? What are we doing here? Like why? And trying to, trying to alleviate the problem. I mean, you're never going to get rid of it, which sucks. And I'm just speaking from experience, but. So yeah. So my, my seizures started um, in 2016. Well, you know, they started, I think in 2010, but they weren't full blown seizures or like micro tremors or micro seizures where I couldn't okay. collect my thoughts. Yeah. I couldn't speak. My right hand generally would drop whatever was in it and it would shake real bad. But usually this would last 20 to 30 seconds. I'd clear my head and then I'd be back you know, with everything, um, that yeah. went on for probably from 2010 to like, you know, like I said, 14, 15 time frame, And I cussed the Marine Corps and cussed my doctors and fought them the whole way saying I'm fine, you know, because I felt like I was fine. Yeah. I didn't know what they could yeah. see. And then, and then I had started having these seizures. It's just the thing. My seizures only come in my, in my sleep. Um, so far I've never had a seizure while I was awake a full blown seizure, uh, but I do have those tremor things. And it's pretty awesome that you just asked that question because have you, um, okay. So let's say this, have you ever heard of or watched the, 
docu-series called Quiet Explosions with Dr. Mark Gordon? Uh, no, I have not, but I'm definitely going to watch it. I'm writing yep, that you down definitely right now. need to watch that tonight. And I would challenge you to not get emotional with the sensation of hope that you feel at the end. And so why I say that is I don't know how um, my blessings uh, I recorded with um, I recorded on the DTD podcast as a guest uh, several months back with DJ Kelly. And uh, he's like a, a, a police officer, first responder, bring in war fighters, anybody that he thinks can impact that same protector community. We had a great time and we recorded and then um, I was supposed to have him come on my show and I ended up having a seizure like the night before I bit my tongue all up. And, I, you know, so I was talking funny and I had to, re you know, I was like, man, we'll reschedule, but I got, you know, I got to get this right. Well, that was a couple months ago. And I, you know, we didn't really talk since then. And uh, he calls me or he hits me up, uh, text me, you know, like one in the morning uh, the other night. Hey, do you know Dr. Mark Gordon and of his work? I said, faintly, what's up? He said, well, I just interviewed him. Uh, you need to look into that, and I'm going to give him your information if that's okay. Now, I don't know what he told Mar uh, Dr. Gordon, but I got a call from him. We ended up talking for our, for like an hour or so, maybe real close to an hour. He got kind of my uh, my story as far as what explosions and such that I had been in. Um, basically, my treatment, uh, you know, what the doctors are saying now, what medications, and so on and so on. And so I... I I believe that I'm going to enter that program, his program. So, I, you know, anybody out there that's str struggling with the seizures, um, you've been blown up, you've been hit, you were fighter, uh, and you have, you know, unexplainable symptoms uh, that replicate PTSD. Uh, maybe you don't have a traumatic injury after all, as far as psychological, but your brain can cause these things. Um, so everybody out there, I would urge you to go watch that podcast tonight. It's, uh, especially if you're on the injured side of it, it's, it monumentally impacted me when I watched it. And then I'm going to be documenting my entire process through this, uh, through this study as a way to try to get it out there to more people when it works at the end. Um, so, Hell yeah, man. so just so you know, when you say it's a life sentence and you kind of got to accept that, I say, fuck that. I say, fuck that. And I don't care if it's not double blind, peer reviewed, studied. If you have a certain percentage of shit that's working better than the old stuff, it's the new science. And when you have to have peer reviewed people make it OK, it's the hand, it's the keys in the hand of the beholder. They now have to say, oh, yeah, his science is better than my science. And now I have yep. to lose all these royalties that I have. It's a stupid a system. Yep. Um, yeah. I think shit yeah. needs to yeah. be reviewed and I think shit needs to be you know, looked at by several people in the field. But if those people hold the patents and the vaccines and the whatevers and the medications, then they're not going to let this new guy come in. Perfect example. Joe Rogan years ago had a guy named Randall Carlson and Graham, Han Graham Hancock. On yep, the show. I watched that. Okay. Yeah. And go Beckley Tepe. Yeah. Right. And yep. they talked and they talked about this stuff. Graham talked about it for years and they called him a, they called him Great a Great example. Great. That's example. a perfect example of people that peer reviewed people. Yep. That's that their livelihood the keys, depends the on keys. their science staying yeah. the number one science. Exactly. And so anyway, I get fired up thinking about that because I think there's so many yeah. people, not just veterans, but there's so many people struggling from things that I think we can absolutely fix, but it's a big racket game. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah, about votes. Yeah, and after is. it's about after the votes are accounted for, it becomes about money, or maybe yep. not in that order. It comes away from yeah. actually helping the people and it's just about the dollar. And that's fucking pathetic. And what I wish they would realize is if you just help the people and unleash the the genius that is the 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 the, the project of America, we've always been the best. But Excellent. if you start handcuffing people's language and you start handcuffing their mind and handcuffing their brain, it it won't be that way. The, like nope. the the, nope. the American, you know, project will end. I know exactly what you're talking about. So yeah. Yeah, how to turn the people man. loose and the ingenuity of the American people are second to none. Yep, that's a fact. And just just how you put that right there, man. Just um, becoming aware of the shit, you know, like you know the tremors and the TBI. Because when you first get out, um, it's hard to sometimes put a name to things because you don't really know what's going on with you. 
And mm-hmm. it's and hats off to you, man, because that's a scary process. I went through it myself. And then you really need to watch yeah. the documentary. In the first 30 minutes of the documentary, you're just gonna be staring at the TV. Probably if you're anything like me, I just had tears rolling on my face because it's like that's me. Everything that dude is saying is exactly how I felt. It hits hard. And he's a hundred percent better now. Wow. So awesome. but you gotta watch it anyway. I will. Yeah, I'm yeah no, definitely off the plug. <laughs> so uh all right let's uh let's get back uh let's get back on you ryan let's let's talk about um where you came from how this all started and uh I, you know i kind of i kind of watched about uh how you grew up and how you're always into shooting hunting and i'm interested in and bro you're as i said before you're a sledgehammer i can see you went, went between deployments you're boxing you, you know you're, you're very very type a personality where does that come from brother who taught my you dad, that? Who's my, your mentor? my parents, man. Yeah, I yeah. come from conservative parents. It was very strict household, but it was a very, my dad is very type A. And there's several stories that I won't tell that I could tell of, you know, seeing that as a kid growing up. And, um, and my dad was an entrepreneur too. So it's not like he went to work for another man uh, to bring money home. So I, I had a different dynamic than some kids because a lot of kids have that. But I had the dynamic of watching a guy that said, like, if he didn't go out and make a, make money today, it, things don't come in. There's no check coming unless you, you work. And so, um, you know, very much was raised in that mindset. My dad was my both my parents were always very um, patriotic, love America. You know, they'd always try to tell us to not be you know, to not take for, take for granted what we have here, because one day we'll know when we're older, we'll know, you know, I'd hear that kind of stuff growing up. And then my grandfather, my great grandfather, so my dad's grandfather was an army medic in World War II and fought, you know, and fought some over there. And I was too young to get any of those stories, but I'm quite certain that patriotism and nationalism, you know, because anytime you have any kind of war, um of any kind and it doesn't matter what country let's say for instance you know uh, a country like russia invades a little country like ukraine right i just held a ukrainian russian war town hall two nights ago and i invited two professors from uncw and a retired army colonel that used to be a uh like un like a, a NATO arms inspector for Seaburn weapons in the Soviet bloc country. So people that know these people, okay, because you know, that's an inf- big, a big old information operation campaign going on. You never know what to believe and what propaganda is real and what's not. Yep. So I wanted to bring in experts and, and then I wanted to ask my own questions. And um, one of the, one of the more pointed things that Dr. Masters, Dan Masters from UNCW, one of the things he said is, um, at the end of this, Ukraine will be every Ukrainian will be more Ukrainian than they ever were before. Like the country of Ukraine is going to be solidified through this. Going to bring them together. The nationalistic pride and the segregation and split finally from Russia will come right here. Gotcha. People aren't going to refer to yeah. Ukrainians as Russians after this, and no, they're all no, the no, same no. people. They're going to be a drastically different people. Maybe and so that's homes. what war does for us, right? And I don't know how I got on that segment. But, Nationalism. But but you have World War II at my great-grandfather's time, which coming out of that, you're going to have nationalistic pride going rampant in the United States. Yep. And yeah. so my yeah. father probably grows up under that tutelage, right? Let down to him. father <laughs> and some of his uncles then were or not uncles, but people in his life were then in Vietnam later, which, which, you know, throws a different curveball because it wasn't such nationalistic pride coming no, out of not that. At all. Right? Yeah, not at all. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> and, so, and so that was a bit different, but they always maintained that, you know, you be proud to be America. America is the light, as Marcus Luttrell would say, right? So, mm. and he's damn spot on, dude. Um, but we won't be the light forever if we handcuff our people and we lock our bro. people's minds oh. up. So, I don't even want to get into that, but would you say uh, that that hunting trip your dad took you on before uh, before you uh, went in the military officially? Did he kind of talk to you a little bit about that? Or you, come on, I read. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we talked. Um, the um, yeah, we went elk hunting right before I right before I went into the Marine Corps. That was kind of like my graduation gift mm. was to go out and do a elk bow hunt. 
And it was solidified at that point. They knew there was no talking me out of it. They knew that. But yeah, I mean, he had the heart to heart, like, you know, any Red father Jason would, I think yeah. any, any father worth his salt would. And, uh, yeah. but I was locked in from September 11th on, I was, there was a, a path set for me where I was going to end up. You know, it's funny. It's funny. I love hearing you say that because uh, when I first started the podcast, I interviewed this uh, comedian. He's a Marine comedian. He was in early, early 80s time frame when they still rock black boots. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And uh, he old he jump boots. Yeah, he kind of, he, you know, he was kind of, he kind of didn't take it as serious like we do. And he's like, he, he asked me, he's like, you know, I told him my, my combat history a little bit. I took a round in the head and a couple of other things. He's like, he's like, why'd you do it? And I was like, and I, I kind of looked at him. I was like, didn't September 11th just hit you different? Didn't it, didn't it, didn't it mean something that we got hit on our own soil? And uh, he kind of just, he, I don't know. It didn't, it didn't really seem like it affected him. Like it affected me. And that kind of just threw me off a little bit. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, you hear everybody nowadays when you say September 11th, Oh, it wasn't bin Laden. It was America that did it to ourselves. You know, regardless, whoever it may be, or if, even if you want to question that Americans died. American mm -hmm. di Americans mm -hmm. died and the Taliban tried to triumph over it. So how could we not want to go over there and have a little gunfight? I mean, yeah, man, when I, uh, I was sitting in, in, uh, high school, my sophomore year. And at the time, you know, it's not like schools today with flat screens in every room. So they wheeled a little, the little, uh, wheeler in a little wheeler TV <laughs> in. And, uh, the last thing that I remember seeing before leaving the school was people, women jumping out of the trade centers and yeah, i thought yeah. what 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 is this this is it's so fucking hot in there and it's such a hellish uh experience that they would rather jump hundreds of feet and hit the top of that lobby window glass now really think about that That's and when i seen that shit. when i seen that it was done yeah. it was like nope I don't give a fuck who it is. Point me in a direction and let me go. Teach me how to do it and then give me direction. And that's the way I remained for a, a while. You know, it took me a long time to, to start maybe thinking from thinking outside of that box no, and outside of that. Uh, outside Question of it that. at all. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Even, yeah. I mean, when you yeah. get older, you start to wonder. Yeah. Especially exactly. when you go there and you do things and then you really start you go to there and actually do shit and you see what's going on over there. <laughs> yeah. And anyone with a sane brain, I mean, critical thinking applies and, and you question things, I hope. But um, OK, so we're in the Marines. I mean, we always ask for one solid boot camp story, dude. Lay one on us. It's hard for me, man. I didn't. Uh, you know, you have some guys that boot camp was a very 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 impactful and big point in their career and then you have guys that it was the smallest part of their career and i'm probably one of those i didn't struggle i played their games you know my dad got me ready for that they're going to tell you to paint the wall white and you're going to do perfect and then they're going to tell you that they told you to paint paint it black don't get emotional just go paint it black it doesn't matter they can't stop time, do everything that, you know, that kind of talk. Well and, said. um, yeah. and so I played that game very much like that. And I let my stomach tell me what time of day it was. And, um, you know, one thing I'll say is, um, coming from the family that I came from and in even the community that I came from was very conservative, uh, alpha type community. Like all my dad's friends and mom's friends were, you know, like they were, their kids were like we were. So that's, and then I went to boot camp and I'm thinking, I'm going to go to the Marine Corps and I'm going to be around all these type A personalities. And I got there, man. And that is not what I found. No. Um, now, now, once I got to the infantry, <laughs> that's what I found. But in boot camp, man, I found a lot of guys that definitely were lost. Yeah. For sure. Or, or were trying to prove something to somebody other than them damn self. Cause if you're trying to prove something to Sally back home, that external motivator ain't going to get you there. Cause, no, uh, and if it does, you're going to, you're not, you're not going to like it on the way. So, um, but I seen a kid piss himself. I, I, I thought it was hilarious. Um, I seen a kid piss himself. There's a, you know, a grown man, um, because he couldn't do the three pull-ups that you needed to do to go in. Oh, they make us yeah. do three pull-ups at least. 
couldn't do them. So you stood right there on the quarter deck and pissed himself. And I just thought that's pretty wild. <laughs> Uh, but I don't have any big ones other than that, man. I have, mm-hmm. I had some good drill instructors. Uh, I still remember them. Uh, one of them ended up coming to three, two, uh, oh, no when shit. I was, when I was there and taking over weapons company. So two of my drill instructors were oh threes. And then, um, and then one of them was a pogue. He's like a supply guy or something like that. So, um, but I had, a, I, I didn't have a bad time. It was easy. Uh, not, not easy, but, but you know what I mean. If you yeah. if you lock into yeah, the flow yeah, yeah, yeah. of it and you just go, and I put out for everything. I know they tell you you should never volunteer for anything in the Marine Corps. I watched some of your stuff too. I always volunteered for stuff. <laughs> and then I had a guy on here, a uh, special operator, a JTAC from the Air Force, operated a lot with uh, Green Berets and uh, Raiders and such. And he said that very thing. He said people told me not to, uh, you know, volunteer my whole career. He said, I always volunteered and I volunteered for the shittiest things that people didn't want. He said, because at the end of the day, I now have that experience that none of them have. And when, like it. when it kind and I was yeah. like, yeah, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. So, so I was very much like that myself. And, uh, and then I kick out to, um, basic security guard school after SOI. So I kick out the SOI after that SOI East over in Lejeune over here where I'm at still. And um, and then I don't know if you want to talk about that. I didn't. I mean, again, uneventful. Outside of training, we trained hard, and um, uh, all of my all of my combat instructors were uh, fresh home from like Fallujah, and so I was going to ask you a little bit about that actually. So the guys yeah. that were training you were just back from Iraq, kind of that first entanglement that we got in with uh yeah fallujah i guess right yeah that makes well, sense. that's a big okay. one yeah so you figure uh oh four in boot camp so this is 2005 i'm an soi and you had like fallujah one i think two oh four oh five time gotcha. frame you got all those guys right there mm-hmm. coming back and um yeah we had this one i never forget him uh you you know, they weren't sadistic. I hear a lot of people say that the people came back and they were just like, you know, straight up tiger land on them. That was not very much tiger not land. the case for me. You know what I mean? But, but we had like every single night, Jacob would get out a letter that he wrote his mom and he would read it to us because he was, a, you know, a junior Marine on that deployment and it was a bad deployment and you hear that kind of stuff. And then, you, you know, the other, the other instructors would tell us stories and stuff of their time. And uh, it made it very much real, right? No matter where you were going from there, the war was on. And all of us that thought we weren't going to make it in time realized then that, eh, no, nah, this is going to keep going. There's no end in sight, right? And so um, so leaving there, I, you know, I was trained, I, you know, basically trained, you know, nothing, nothing special. But then I went to basic security guard school up in Chesapeake, Virginia, because I was in a security forces contract. My first two years were to go to security forces. Can you break that down for me a little bit? How, so is that, that's just not a line company. That's just, what is that? No, like so, QRF for? Yeah, it's, it's just different. So there's different aspects to security forces. And, and I know on Ryan's show, I maybe made it sound a lot sexier than it is. What I, the part that I did and the missions I got were really cool. And the, and, and the command structure I had, it made it very cool. But generally what you have is, okay, you got security forces. They take care of like uh, some Kings Bay, Georgia and Bremerton, Washington uh, submarine things. Gotcha. If you go there, that's your post. Well, when you go there and that's your post, there is no infantry. There is no field. There is no tactics. Mm. There is none of that. For two years, you're like in a bunker doing things that you do in a bunker. Then you have, you know, security forces, Camp David and presidential security. That's a whole different branch. Again, you're going to go up there and you're not going to do a whole mm-hmm. lot of tactical stuff in your, in your MOS because your MOS is an 03, but you've got this first two years for there. And then you have uh, Fast Company, which is Fleet Anti-Terrorism Security Team. They're out of uh, Norfolk, Virginia. They used to be out of Yorktown as well, but I think they're all at uh, and down in Norfolk now. And um, you're basically... It depends on how big their platoons and how many they are. When I was there, there's five platoons and you're basically shot out as little uh, QRF forces for like when I went, I was Southeast Asia. So any of the embassies or anything that goes down Southeast Asia and they need a trap mission. Now you have O3s that are trained heavily in CQB while they're at where they're at that 
MOS that we did gotcha. live kill houses yeah. and, and all kinds gotcha. of stuff. So they're heavily trained in that at your disposal. Problem mm -hmm. is usually it's a Mew commander, something like that, that's running the show and they don't understand the asset that they gotcha. have. So a lot gotcha. of times they don't get anything sexy that comes across the pipe. If so that that's, makes sense. That's kind of why that, that stigma is there when you go back to a line company, the, sig the stigma is real. And, you know, it's like uh, stereotypes are stereotypes for a reason. Right. So when you come back to the fleet and you've been meritoriously promoted to corporal and you've never deployed outside of maybe Cuba or QRF to Bahrain, which likely you didn't get a mission or Spain. Right. Um, and you come in and now you're going to take a, you're going to take a squad at the time or a team now, uh, above a guy that's been to Iraq one or two times and led a team, potentially a squad, and you're going to take that over. Why? Because of gotcha. all your experience. Gotcha. Right? And and so generally they come over thinking, no, I'm taking it over because I'm a corporal, and you're going to call me corporal, Lance Corporal, and then you know how far that floats over in the yeah, victory absolutely. unit, yeah. right? And then so that yeah. becomes the stigma. But, you know, I've had a lot of guys, a lot of Marines that I've talked to, and a lot of them started in the security forces fast company that that were hitter hitters. Uh, yeah. and, and I think most of that is attributed to a they had probably a really good command and b all of the shooting packages because they just give you a shit ton. That was so. my next question. What, what would you say was the the best things that you pulled from there to that got, you know, annotated into, you know, Afghanistan or the things that you used? to to really you know shine out of from out of my fast company time oh definitely um well man that's hard my my command was awesome so i learned all of a, a lot of things from my command just watching them because they were good at their jobs but i would say the best training i ever got in my whole career was why i was in, in uh at fast and that was uh advanced urban combat school in Chesapeake, Ooh. Virginia. Gotcha. And like, so you start out shooting steel on time from sidearm to primary, primary to sidearm. You do, we did a little Hearst Masters course. It wasn't Hearst Masters course, but our culminating event, we had a squad come out of helicopters down onto the kill house roof and a squad that moved, made movement to objective live ammo and then do a, uh, you know, a uh, connecting file on the second floor, you know, just how you do or how they were trained at the time. And it was dope. It was killer. And it was a long school where the whole platoon stayed in the squad bay together. And you stayed on the premises the whole time. So it's just tons of shooting. Uh, so when I went to the fleet, man, they also don't like things like this, but you go back to the fleet and you see a bunch of people teaching room clearing completely wrong. Mm -hmm. After you just come out of a school like that and you're like, let me tell you how to do it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. It doesn't work out. Yeah. doesn't work gotcha. out well, even when you're right. Yeah. I'm sure. sure there's ways to uh, go about that. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> when you're coming from three, two to three, six, and you're picking up your squad and you, you talked about how they were originally slated for, uh, for a beer run there. I, I'm another Mew. Um, and then you, you know, got switched around that you were going to go to, to Marja. What was it like clicking into that squad, man? How did you, I, I know, I know there's a lot of things when it comes to that. That's a new face for them. Um, these guys probably already were a unit and they were already, you know, clicking well together. Being a squad leader is a huge deal in a victory unit. Um, these are things that you have to take seriously. Now, talk to me about that. Um, I think I was at the point in my career where I was so confident. I, I didn't really give a shit. I was getting a squad and I was going to combat on a main invasion and I was stoked. Um, but I had had squads before and I made mistakes with them and learned how how maybe I should handle myself. And when I took over, I didn't take over. I simply stepped into a position that was no longer um, filled. I gave my expectation brief to my Marines and I requested them to give me their expect expectations of me because I know that it's a rough transition you just had a squad leader basically bail on you because it turned yeah. from a booze cruise to a real thing yeah and they felt that there was feelings yeah. about that in that squad all the way through even to the point when we got home even to the point where some of them wouldn't talk to him today because of that and that's not for me and and i told him hey man guys got kids you none of you got kids at the time 
You don't know what he's going through. However, mindsets. I would have never done that. Of course. If I worked you all the way up, I'm taking you point blank period. And that's just the way I, you know, that's the way that's I who do you things. are. That's who you are. Right. And, and so I, but I don't know what's going on in his life. There might've been some mm. horrible stuff going on in his life and maybe he shouldn't been leading Marines in combat and maybe it was a blessing. So, you know, I half fool, I guess. I don't... Bro, you can really tell that you're a different type of person. Just the way you, yeah. you think and the way that you talk, uh, you can <laughs> tell that you think of all, every type of thing that could happen or could be the scenario where a lot of people don't do that. They just think about what they know and what they would do. You think yeah. of everything. And well, as a leader, that's I a don't must. do that always on the spot. I've had, you know, 12 years to think about that situation. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, yeah. um, but I had to tell that to them, you know, you're going to, what, you're going to hold hate for this guy. You don't, you don't know who, what's going on in his life. You, you don't know anything. So how about you just agree that you had a whole year workup and y'all should be fine no matter who's at the helm and we'll make it rock. Like, and that's what we did. You know, I was still learning some of them dudes is, you know, some of my guys' names on the push. Um, wow. Hey, you, you know, I fucking mm. can't remember your name, you know? So that's, mm. that's, that's got brings challenges. And then, you know, they got to trust you. Uh, so you got to build trust. Um, that's the big one. No, especially in combat. I mean, <laughs> yeah. we built, we built trust in the first 24 hours on that one, but that's a so hard thing involved at all in the workup. No, the only, uh, the only, uh, training i did with my marines before we left was the helo dunker because we were helicopter company oh, and we that. did one kd range one known distance range uh to confirm uh battle zeros to three to 500 and after we did that we went on um we went on pre-deployment christmas leave essentially and then we came home and we pumped so no, we're we, talking kind of fast for the listeners right now and i'm kind of well versed on him because i've watched some of his stuff so if you could Talk about how you went on a few deployments, really didn't get much out of them. And then all of a, all of a sudden, Marja came up and you're getting ready to do the damn thing. Yeah. So like, like you said, my first two deployments in fast, one was to Cuba. One was to Bahrain as a quick reaction for Southeast Asia embassies and such. And uh, we actually got a mission on the second one. Cuba was cool. It was a cool deployment. It was a cool deployment to have as a boot uh although you stood all the watch you know and that's what that <laughs> deployment is um it was cool to stay and watch as a boot in a place where people weren't shooting at me i'm thankful for that because my boots didn't get that break-in deployment uh for marja right so uh, we did that and then the, the bar rain trip was awesome like like people might hate me for it i had a great time we ran cliffside and went cliff diving into the med every morning until we got uh pushed over and then basically it was uh it was a non non-combatant evacuation out of uh, Beirut, Beirut, Lebanon. And so we assisted the strike group with that, uh, manned up a couple of uh, ferry and uh, cruise liner boats. And then we evacuated people across the Med over to a little island called Cyprus, uh, where the people would then be rerouted for free flights. And we you know, they'd get loaded up on the planes and flown to wherever home or safety was. And these were American citizens and their families, right? So people okay. eligible to get out of there. Uh, with u.s forces so that was a feel-good mission that's another great mission to get as a boot and and uh right there early in your career and feel good about a mission and go and you're helping people and that's great um the other thing that you know happened in those three years is i got great training it was a great time to train and get good proficient at my job proficient with my weapon and uh get ready to kick into the fleet and then, you know, in fast, I had a great command structure and we trained like probably 15 days out of every month. At least we were out, we, we hiked, we rucked, we, we did tactical, um, training just like you would in a Victor unit on Lejeune or out at Pendleton, you know? So, um, though there was a stigma when I came to the fleet about what I would be, uh, that wasn't me. And I took over a really? squad as soon as I got to three, two, um, would you say just traveling like that though, and 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 taking those type of deployments, you, you matured a lot of, though. Just just seeing the world a little bit. No, I, th I think I seen the world a little bit, but I think I was still a young lance <laughs> corporal that liked to party and. Um, gotcha. When I look back on it, I wish I would have went and 
you know, cultured myself in the places that I was that weren't dangerous, you gotcha. know, because yeah. now, now, now it costs my money to go to those places. Right, You're not so, going to have that chance again, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe not. Some of them, for sure, not. So, um, but it matured me as a marine for sure. I got to see some other things. Got to be in some hairy situations. Um, definitely in Bahrain, the people out in town, there were some hairier situations there, where it's like I don't have a gun and I'm in mm. a bad place, kind of thing. And uh, so I had some of those experiences, but uh, came back from that. Um, that operation went well. We left Bahrain. We came home. We disbanded the platoon and everybody went their separate ways. And that's when I end up over at Lejeune at 2nd Marines, over there at 3rd Battalion, 2nd Marines. Gotcha. End up in Lima Company there and uh, do a whole workup as a squad leader. Um, and then we push into al -Qaim. And this would have been 2007. We would have pushed into al -Qaim. We would have come out of there in 2008, probably. I think it was 07, 08 deployment. And um, really, really let down. Really, it, it, again, if I look at big picture, it was a great deployment to go on and learn how to operate and patrol a squad in an urban environment where mm. you're in the Badlands. And that was great. But it, yeah, the kinetics weren't there. It's, gotcha. I wanted to fight. And I'm patrolling and getting pop shots and IEDs was the whole deployment. Um, and we had a couple little incidents here and there, but nothing where I felt like I proved myself to myself, what, what I wanted to see, you know, no. Well, and, well just uh, you saying that right there, though, one of my follow up questions when we get into Marja, um, something that I felt from Afghanistan, because we dealt with a lot of IEDs, um, mm -hmm. talking sometimes fine in, you know, five, six a day, daisy mm -hmm. chain, whatever. I, I heavily felt that we didn't have the training that was up to par with the type of combatics that we were dealing with when it came to IEDs. Maybe that was because Afghanistan was a shithole and there was trash everywhere and, you know, everything beeped on the sticks, or maybe we just didn't get, you know, we weren't up to par with, or the Taliban was just sucking up our TTPs and SOPs. Um, and they were, you know, advancing through that and they were adapting and overcome like we should have been um how did you feel about the ied threat and how you were trained because i mean you just said you, you dealt with it there man i think we over? i think we had to evolve with the ied threat um like for instance i did my iraq deployment i did my afghanistan marja deployment came home from that become an instructor at itb over here at soi east and there was never an ied I, there was never an IED identification or defeat lane ever in doctrine taught to kids. We've been in war for 15 years at that point with IEDs. So we wrote one, myself and uh, Stephen Lawson. I don't know if they still use it or hopefully they've made it way better. But my, the idea is IEDs are the first IED was like the the uh, the IRA was the first known IED, right? Yeah. So it's not new. This is old business. and um, guess what you can be as trained as you want and if they buried the fucking wire right yeah, you're not going to see it and it's going to blow true. your legs off yeah how can you train? that's ieds yeah and guess yeah. what if you do see it likely it has a dual initiated phone attached yeah. to it that you're going to blow your legs off anyway with it Secondary so it's like yeah. like dude ieds are tough man that's why they work so well that's why they're so effective is because you can do everything right and you can still fuck that up you, you know and, and people are going to die uh for me and Marja, specifically on that deployment, there was IEDs. They were everywhere, but they were not the biggest threat for us. As you would expect, you would, you know, from years in Iraq, you would expect that the IEDs are the biggest threat. Machine guns, snipers, and small teams maneuvering on us to yeah. kill us were the biggest threat. And I think that maybe initially there wasn't so many IEDs because they knew they were going to maneuver on us as well. And then they got to watch out for their own exactly. shit. They don't want to be stepping on their own shit. Right. Right. Yeah. And so, and then, and then it became, they're going to pay farmers, not pay farmers. They're going to take farmers, little girls Muscle and, them. Yeah. and tell them you're going to do this from a raper and barrier in a shallow yep. grave. And then he's going to go do it. And then we're going to smoke him too. Yep. And yeah. it sucks, no, but it's the way it is. Right. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, and, so you were with you were with three six in Marza, right? Yeah, yeah. So we were part of your QRF. Um, I got fapped out. Just I was a I was a whore. 
I, I got <laughs> sent to so many different units. Like that's how me and Nick met. I got sent to them as a combat replacement too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I was with three twenty five right there, and we were you guys QRF. And yeah, dude, no, it was just yeah, it was fucking ridiculous out there, man. And it was, and it was like wild. You said, yeah, like you said too. Like I remember we came up on this one, and we got called in as a QRF. We came up and there's these three fucking dead dudes. And I'm like, all right, well, they're not ours. They're not us. But those same thing. They stepped on their own fucking IED. And I was like, fuck yeah. Yep. <laughs> like, I know that sounds so screwed up to so many people, but no, yeah, just, better, like, better than yeah. the Marines. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or yeah, soldiers. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Um, okay. So you said you got a, a little bit of training with your guys. You're clicked in with your squad. You guys are heading over there, bro. Where's the mindset at? Where's yeah, I got. I got. I got to tell you, my mindset was not good until that deployment got switched over. So after three twos deployment, they were going on a mew, and I didn't want to do that. And so I went and tried out for the All Marine Boxing Team on Lejeune, made it, boxed for nine months. Then I come over to three six, and I get to three six in like like the end of August or early September and between and, and the Sergeant major wasn't there. Right. Cause why would the Sergeant major be at his battalion? And we could talk right. about that guy offline. I won't <laughs> do that to him here. However, he wasn't there for one reason or another. Well, he's the one that's supposed to tell us, assign us to a company so that that company first sergeant can sign us to a platoon. And that doesn't happen for 60 days. You want to know what happened instead? I got to look at like seven miles of Marine Dick. During your analysis, after uh. your analysis, after your analysis, after your analysis, uh. <laughs> because they're pumping up to a deployment. And now they got these new five sergeants coming in that are all certified PP watchers. And they're uh. like, oh, yeah. So it was every Monday I got to go and look at male dicks Cock watch. for hours, bro. <laughs> hours. So oh, that good. was sweet. So that's where my <laughs> mindset was, was when, when uh, President Obama finally. Uh, got to his assigning that look, you know. I say finally, he's the president. I'm I'm sure he got to as fast as he could. But we were all waiting for him to sign that paper so we could go. And we were in the shoot, and we're like, if he doesn't sign it soon, it, and then he signed the paper for troop increase, and we got slid straight in. And then my mindset drastically improved. Gotcha. From from Dick watching. So yeah. Hi, Happy Corman. Year. <laughs> yeah you guys are built different it doesn't bother you the same hey man <laughs> <laughs> shipmate hey, so, um, calm down there brother <laughs> so uh you guys uh you guys get over to Leatherneck. um you're on bastion you you see uh you, you see all you see all the muscle you see all you see all the stuff that you're gonna be using man everyone's gunned up kitted up Battle rattle, full in effect. Um, come on, where's the mindset then, man? Then it was locked in, man. I never seen anything like that. I never seen the amp like the airfield was insane. But before the airfield, we got to get our ammo allotment, and the ammo allotment for a squad was ridiculous. It was like a couple pallets with laws and claymores and grenades and bangs and and just at all of it, all of it. And so, and and then you go out to the airfield and I just never, I, I remember telling Ryan uh, on his show, like I have never seen that many aircraft at the same place before, all doing the same thing in these tactical motions. And, and like, you know, our guys, <laughs> some of the guys are wearing bandanas and, you know, under their shit. And some of the guys have machine gun rounds like Rambo going across while wow, because their packs couldn't fit anymore and we had mm -hmm. to take everything we could take yeah. right yeah, mortar fibers strapped to the outsides of people's shit cargo pockets you know people some people had grenades in their cargo pockets it, I, it was insane um it was insane it was everything you wanted to be i mean and, you gotta uh, be putting shit together at that point bro you gotta be like oh you know you know iraq everything i'd ever done was like a dry hole kinetically like and so that's where I was. And and that's where I tried to be for my Marines. I'm like, dude, relax. You're freaking out about nothing. Gotcha. 
Gotcha. And then that changed in like uh, six minutes <laughs> after we were on the ground. So <laughs> no, it was in a dry hole. So, uh, but we so were locked in, man. Everybody was good. Everybody so felt good. Some of the junior Tom. Marines, you know how that goes. Some of the junior Marines, oh, yeah. they're right on the, you know, the cusp of this and, and it's their first deployment, you know, and, and then we hand out each squad three body bags to pack in. Um, yeah. I never, I never had to do that before. Mm. I was never the first invading force that had to pack your sandbags under your flat jacket sappies that and hits. you had to pack, you know, body bags with you. And, you know, I've been working for a while, but I never had to do that. And when we did that, you could see that somber, mm. um, you know, emotion hit a lot of the, a lot of them little guy, little, if, most of them bigger. If you could, if you could, uh, what was the, uh, what was the mission? I mean, I think Hellman Province was the mission, um, but our mission was to infiltrate under the cover of darkness on February 12th, roundabout. I think they kicked it one day to the left or right, I, I, to the right. Um, but we were, we were to infiltrate uh, and then make movement to a foothold compound that was on the t intersection of 608 and 605 which were two msr's uh, main supply routes coming into marja and simul simultaneously one of the other platoons is going to be hitting a little village across the street from where our foothold would be called shinny wall and as they cleared shinny wall we would be responsible for making sure they didn't get backfilled on the msr's as well as covering down on them if their squirters coming out our way, so on and so on, right? And um, and then follow on. Uh, so this was all supposed to happen in 24 hours. We were supposed to take our objective. It took almost four days. So the next part of the mission after they secured Shinny Wall and we guarded the MSRs, we would then go to gonna kind of leapfrog them up about three clicks to a main bazaar where a uh uh, Taliban facilitator and bomb maker was located mm -hmm. at allegedly with uh, you know this see different agencies came in and briefed us with pictures of like OE antennas and stuff like that and we didn't know if that was going to be our you know what we're looking for but they said it was like a command center so you would imagine there'd be some kind of antennas right and that's what we were supposed to take down kill kill capture eliminate him and then foothold in the area until engineers could could get in there to to make a Ford out uh, a fob you know Ford yep. Yep. base for us and um and then it, you know obviously then the mission changes again to now we're going to saturate the area to deny the enemy freedom mm -hmm. of movement um which has been copy and pasted for twenty years on mission statements but it's exactly what we do you know. Yeah. You go from moving wherever you want to having six or eight squads of hitters out blowing your bridges up in your backyard and daring you to come out. And, and some yeah. of them did, you know, some of them did for the first couple of days. And so if you could dude, let's talk day one. Yeah. So, um, day one starts very early in the morning, obviously it's like one o'clock. We're doing the Marine Corps shuffle over to the bastion side to get, airborne that takes forever you know and you're you know how it is bitching marines a happy marine i guess but you got 100 pounds of gear <laughs> on top of your 80 pounds a year 60 pounds a year so yeah. you're sitting heavy as shit it's cold as fuck i remember being so cold and like a little sleety you know i think well, it was people don't realize that it, that you get cold over there well, I always try to talk about that shit, man, because it's all fun and games to talk about the hitting and, and tell people about the emotions. But talking about like uh, the stuff that we talked about the last time that me and you talked cultural mm. and talk about the elements and talk about what adrenaline and, and cortisone cocktails, dopamine cocktails do to a Marine in a firefight. Yep. Yep. Talk about hypothermia and losing Marines to MRSA because we couldn't get a scratch cleaned up quick enough. Wow. I like to talk about those things because those things are overlooked a lot. You know, we're so worried about the fucking mission most of the time that, you know, you don't think that your Marine bumping his shin on a mud hut wall is going to cause him to mm. have a full blood transfusion in Germany Damn, and almost die. Yeah. And that shit happened yeah. to my guys. Wow. You don't think about a Marine coming in and the mud sucking his pants off and not having other pants for three days. Oh, when it's 46 to 40, 
two degrees and raining. And then you don't think about, you know, just just the fog of war and the elements and, and, and all the different um, uh, little idiosyncrasies of war is, is what we don't talk about. You know, we copy and paste what we, you know, the flashy things, but sexy stuff. Yeah, we're yeah, really, yeah. really good at a lot of parts of war, the United States, uh, and a lot of other people aren't as good logistically, equipment and maintenance, maintenance. Um, but you'll never be able to control the elements. You'll never mm. be able to control those cocktails in your body the way that you want to control them. So I like talking about that. So people are thinking about that when they go. Right. Smart. Much like Dave Grossman wrote a book called yep. On Combat and On Killing. Yep. Had him on my show and I told him, you know, what you did by having, you know, by by doing that, you never even had to kill anybody. And you changed a whole generation of war fighters yeah, because you made us think about maybe what would happen. Mm -hmm. And then when it happened, it was like, oh, I'm not freaked out about this. No. This is supposed to fucking happen. Right. Yeah. And so once you realize what's supposed to happen. And the, and the quicker we can destigmatize issues coming home because we're supposed to have issues when we kill our own species. I told you when we talked offline. It's not a normal thing. Go to combat and annihilate and maim each other and kill our own species and nobody fucking struggles from it. We all have lo already lost. Yeah. It's all, none of it's worth it anymore anyways. You know? And so those are the things I like to talk about. Anyway, if you want to get back to day one, a lot of that, prefaces day one because day one we got stuck in the mud two of my marines is left pant legs um, ripped from you know all oh, you just up. in a were you, were you in a wadi full of just mud and water is that what that was <laughs> sorry it's i don't mean to bring you back there it's a, it's a it's a sensitive subject so we were on an army chinook with army pilots and i do not fault them because the ied threat in the area was so large that i'm sure somebody planned out exactly where he was setting that bird down and there was no deviating from that I'm sure of it. However, he landed us right in the middle of a flooded poppy field. Oh. And when I say flooded, I mean, we lost rockets that we couldn't recover even with metal detectors after this. Packs that got eaten into this. Wow. Um, Lance Corporal Vicolo, who ends up getting shot on the 13th in the shoulder. He goes down after he steps off the bird. Boom. And guys are stepping on him and he's going down into the mud. Oh, my God. Like into Fuck. it. And, and yeah. his buddies had to grab him and wedge him and his pack got sucked off of him within uh you know with rockets and munitions and and like potentially one two more people come out onto him and he goes under that and people oh, don't see man. him you like who would have ever thought um you know and, and when that happened so this is minute two minute one and now i have you know what was a 54 man chalk of just fire breathing animals full of weapons is now just the animals because i have like six guns operable because of all the mud and um and then we had an ac 130 circling above and they were kicking out ir canisters for us and they rogered down and said that we had an enemy uh platoon size element moving on us from the north said prepare to defend yourself Wow. And when he said that, my fax uh, radio was on blast, so the entire chalk hears that, right? And the young guys are, you know, getting a little squirrely. Young lieutenants more than young enlisted. Um, one, Shocker. one young, Shocker. one young, one no, young lieutenant. Uh, still talk to him; he's a great guy, but he 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 had a moment. Um, Lost it a little bit. He had a moment, yeah. And my six foot three platoon sergeant from Maine slapped taste out of his mouth. And told him to shut the fuck up. <laughs> he Thanks. said, "Shut the fuck up," but he did say, "Sir," afterwards. Uh, I guess everything was okay. They're still friends. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but that happens, and I'm like, "Oh my god!" And I look in my nods over to the north, and sure enough, there was those big round bales, you know, of the like poppy stems and shit. Mm -hmm. And they were moving bale to bale. I seen RPGs up the shoulder, you know, machine guns. I'm like, "Oh my god!" So I go over to a fact. Uh, forward air controller and i'm like hey let's go get skids on station and, and maybe it was my platoon sergeant that worked that part but what at any rate skids came on station cobra cobra's section and uh just as they're coming in from the ip and he's clearing them hot i look back out to the enemy mass coming at us and uh, <clears throat> the, uh infrared flicker is on the chest of the point man and here this, this, is a &A. A, this is the partnered a and a patrol that got a little turned around and we're coming from a direction that they didn't 
bro were supposed oh my to, God. and they had forgot up until that point to turn on the flicker they were supposed to turn oh. it on before they left the ground so you almost greased them uh yeah so yeah you know our our lieutenant mathlier was i think it was mathlier he's you know aboard 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 like something out of a movie wow and you know countermeasures are dropping us like oh my god and i just like i think my platoon sergeant could see it in my face you know because it was like this is minute five and it's, this is bad you know talk to me about that lesson what was i didn't really understand what you meant about that bro what, what yeah that's what I, that's what i was about to get at so <laughs> yeah joe Wright, man if you're out there you listen to this it was a big one for me. So he didn't, he said two words, but it was the biggest lesson um, that I learned in the first day, at least. And maybe one of the bigger lessons I've ever learned, uh, especially about leading people in any situation, any, any fortune 500, 100, 200 Marine Corps, it doesn't matter what, when you're leading an element for a common goal, <laughs> he said, so what? And I just kind of looked at him. He's like, so what? Because it doesn't fucking matter. There goes our fucking ride and we got to kill all these motherfuckers or all of us die anyway. So it doesn't matter how you feel about it. So what? Get your shit. We're moving. Like that kind of thing. Damn. And I, I think he just sensed it because I wasn't, I wasn't projecting it. <laughs> but Or maybe he was feeling it too. And maybe he's yeah, like yeah, giving yeah. us both a pep talk, but it worked, gotcha. right? Um. And and going back to like what you said before about the whole the whole the whole country is trash. They don't have a trash service, and a lot of their stuff is metal and metal wrappers and things of that nature. So when you take the metal detector out to you know detect you a path up there, everything beeps, and then every little bridge mm-hmm. has metal structures inside of it. Everything beeps, and so very early on the trip over to the foothold building my point man just stayed back and I would walk up to the land bridges and I would tap my foot on it. I'd say a small prayer and I'd be like, tap, tap, tap. I'd hold my junk dude. Like, (laughs) like that was going to stop, you know, 50 pound jug (laughs) of anal from blowing me all the way. But you know, that's what it became very early. Like, okay, let's just go. We got to get the fuck out of this field before the sun comes up. Cause they're everywhere. And, um, so we made the, you know, we made the foothold building and what was great was when we came in there, um, when we came in there, they had a freshwater well. And so we were able to bring buckets of fresh water up and get all of our guns ba- bathed down and punched gotcha. and cleaned uh, because they were a fucking mess. All of our gear was a mess. So, so that was cool. Cause not everywhere had a well over there, as you know. Yeah. Um, so that was really dope. And then, um, Obviously and then priority this, one. Yeah, yeah. So then the sun comes up we go out and recover some gear now that we got machine guns up finally the sun comes up and uh, we're setting up an apob system because when the sun comes up we see there's ieds on this land bridge that we have to cross to reinforce the other platoons and to go where we need to go after they're done it's a big boom it's a big boom and um set that up as i'm out there with eod and the little security team kind of setting it up eod's checking the structural composition of the bridge just to make sure that it can even take this amount of blast and um, as we're setting all that up, the machine gun, you know, Taliban machine gun barks off from the north, which is directly behind the bridge I'm setting up on. And uh, bop, 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 it goes off. I grab Simmering, John Simmering, one of my saw gunners. He was with me out there. We run back into our compound, which was directly next door to the foothold building. And, um, and we run up these poppy stems because they had like, you know, eight, 10 foot walls around all their compounds um, because they've been at war since biblical times and they wised up, I guess. Facts. Yeah. Yeah. And so we run up these poppy stems that were in the corner and it made a perfect firing platform. And I, I I seen two guys about three, 400 out and uh, they were running like away from us. I think they, you know, figured out that maybe they'd fucked up. And, um, I would always pack my magazines with tracers and I let a couple of tracers go and it dove like right in front of them. Boom, boom. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So it's not three. Maybe it is four. Uh, I pulled up to the four, put the stadia line on him. He was like crouched down a little bit. He was moving, but he's moving slow. And like, you know, I don't think they could tell. I don't think they knew how well we could see them. 
um, and plugged him. Boom, he goes down. He's still trying to move a little bit, hit him a couple more times, put him down hard. Boom, boom. And as soon as I'm, like, putting him down hard, the other guy, he's got the PKM, just takes off running. But Simrim is following my tracer, so he had his saw up right beside me, and he lets, like, a 15-piece burst go. And just, I mean, just pummels this Plugged guy. him up. Yeah, as soon as that happens, the battlefield, like, in all of Northern Marsha opened up. It was like, there was fights every fucking where. And you got to think like a whole company invades. We got three platoons that came in on choppers and we got three ca- uh, uh, counterpart Afghan platoons that landed with them. So we, we put some people in their backyard, a lot of people. And then once the first little round started going mm-hmm. off, everybody started, you know, yeah. doing their thing. So. um, Now, when you, when you say you loaded your uh, mags with, with traces is that is that for you to call out targets yeah that way you know that was my way to mark anything ideally gotcha. as a squad leader in a victor unit unless you know in a victor squad you, you shouldn't be shooting a whole lot you should be mm-hmm. coordinating fires you should be maneuvering like my 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 number primary weapon is my marines i got three team leaders and then they're those three team leaders primary weapon is their three marines yeah. that they have um, and so ideally I don't do much shooting generally. Well, never did uh, until then. And in that deployment, I shot all the time. Um, it got to a point where I stopped doing the whole tracer thing. Um, I do, I do like two to one or three mm-hmm. to one because I had ho- whole magazines of tracers originally. And it's like, dude, we're burning tracers up because I'm in gunfights instead of marking yeah. them with them. You know what I mean? So um, but very effective. So for you young, young guys out there, keep that in mind when you go to the Pacific Island hopping campaigns in the future. Uh, you can mark targets with those little orange fireflies for you guys. It's a beautiful yeah. thing. It's a beautiful thing, too, when they don't know. And then you let like two or three of those rip into the mm. enemy position. And then your whole squad. We see them now, Sergeant. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good feeling. Gotcha. Talking guns, baby. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. So, so what's the what's day the one ends with that with that yeah. big boom you talked about before if you want to close out day one we fight for six seven hours or so um you know evening time falls and i think they were very aware that we owned the night from the beginning they all the stupid ones died in iraq and in afghanistan in the early days right mm-hmm. or for the most part so no, these, ones, these ones are weathered they know that mm-hmm. we have nods they know capabilities and such and so um sun fell they shut off and went home for chai and you know called a prayer i guess or whatever it was they were going to do they sh- they turned off completely off of us and um lt hit me up over the comms uh e-man lieutenant emmanuel shout out he hit me up he's like yo saw rogers let's wake these motherfuckers up because <laughs> it had been a little bit and sun had fell and uh and we ripped that apop shot off and and it woke everybody up uh, I'm I'm pretty certain on that side yeah, of the I world. <laughs> mm-hmm. what's, and the, so, what's the civilian populace like at that time, dude? The gar- they're gone, man, which was really, yeah. really cool. I know that happened in a couple of main hits in Iraq, like Fallujah 2. They dropped leaflets and said, get the fuck out because we're going to kill everything that moves at night. Uh, don't move at night. Don't be there if you don't yeah. want to fight. And, and I, of course, I was there, and, you know, we got locked down into River City several days before uh, the actual pump. So they shut the phones off. There was no comms going out or in, uh, for OPSEC purposes, yep. but then they went on like Al Jazeera and told them, Hey, we're coming. This is where we're coming. This is a block window of when we're going to be there. And if you don't want to fight us, you should leave. Mm. And the people did, they listened The people that didn't want to fight. They, they, they coiled up like a Marine unit in the open desert and lived like gypsies for about 30 days or so. Yeah. And after the bulk of the fighting, they started to move back in, <laughs> which, didn't happen like you would think would happen you would think they'd just come back and move into their house and have their shit back but they didn't they took the biggest houses that were vacant still and then that caused problems obviously that we that we had to deal with because now they're stealing from each other and and such so um yeah so the local populace uh and you know the kids were great the kids in every country i've ever been to they're just the collateral damage of these wars Um, unfortunately um Mm -hmm. yeah and 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 then when when we don't accomplish the mission like like we thought we would like let's say in iraq or afghanistan and then we leave um it's a whole nother generation that hates us for a million different reasons facts facts 
and we were yeah. there to help them from yeah. the beginning you know so it's hard how it goes though unfortunately um you like that you like that sometimes so to lighten the mood a little bit <clears throat> talk about talk about living in the desert get a living in the desert man i'm talking like hesco furniture wag bags figuring out new ways to do things like creating cold water somehow with a fan and a wet sock or you know what i mean going and buying your own ice at 40 pounds a block carrying yeah. it back two clicks to your patrol base yeah i've been there um the okay. desert sucks man um there's cool things uh, you know that i experienced there and from the scorpions to the different animals and snakes and stuff like that um but i don't like the desert I, there's not mm. I, I don't like it um I like the beach because I can go get in that beautiful ocean and I can get that sand off of me, but I did not like the desert. Uh, in Iraq, I got hit with sandstorms and you had sand mm -hmm. in every piece of you. Um, I didn't like that by rain. I, I got hit with some sandstorms. So I already didn't like the sand. Um, but the desert gets cold as fuck at night too. That's another yeah, thing does. people don't think about. It'd be hot, um, but it gets really, really cold too. And so you got to kind of adapt to that. But then when you get in the summer months, uh, talking about the elements specifically, it, it's absolutely miserable because you're just sweating always, mm -hmm. always and forever sweating yeah. uh, from like the time you wake up. Oh, and by the way, you're woken up because the sun touches you and it's like 100 degrees at six in the morning, Covered 120 flies. by eight. Yeah. And at nine o'clock when you're punching out with 100 pounds of gear on, you're just you just like a watery just a watery mess. mess and that's without fighting that's before contact right so um that's tough but i mean we're marines you know like and what american fighting men we'll go anywhere and we'll kill you anywhere we just don't always have to like it i don't like the desert i wish we could have invaded a place with beautiful women you know why couldn't that never like, happens <laughs> france, france or something france keeps messing around talking to Xi Jinping. man you've been happen. seeing that you've been seeing He's that He's up homie Hey, old Macron. Yeah, I've been seeing him. Nuts. Uh, another thing I want to talk to you about, for me at least, this is something that I observed as a young Marine in combat. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the importance of just a a fluid, uh, a fluid just relationship between a solid interpreter and a lieutenant that can actually move and groove over there when i say interpreter we had a terp that knew how to translate things that you needed to hear he didn't just tell you the bullshit he didn't yeah. just tell you you know the things yeah. he was supposed to he interpreted things that our lieutenant needed to hear to implement to his ncos so we could we could be effective mm -hmm. you, you know what i mean with that 100 percent. there are lifeblood over there there are lifeline the communication yeah. barrier is so vast that without terps interpreters um i don't think that's derogatorily no taken by them in any way so but terps man they're great and, and I, I i had some really really good terps and uh our, our 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 fight was a squad fight you know so most of the time i am the senior man with the terp in my unit you know there's times my lt would be with us there's times my platoon sergeant would be with us but generally speaking marja was a squad fight we had squads out everywhere we weren't fighting a platoon fight uh very much a squad and team level fight you know with different assets sprinkled in so um we i became very uh tight with my terps both uh, we had one little one named tank he didn't make it all the way through uh the, the elements got him and he was a little guy trying to carry a lot of stuff a big gotcha. load so um but cameron cameron astana uh, still friends today. Uh, he he rolled with my squad a lot, and and he was one of those guys. Uh, he was an ethnic Tajik, so uh, different bloodline than the Pashtun Taliban and the Pashtun people down there. And you know, I'd never realized <clears throat> at the time. I didn't realize he was ethnic Tajik. That stuff mm -hmm. I've learned about him since. Um, but it makes a lot of sense. I didn't know he grew up in the same district as uh, Ahmed Shah Massoud, uh, who is the war hero of Afghanistan's Pashmir Valley that fought against yep. the Russians and fought against yep. the Taliban and fought against everybody. His son now runs his organization because Osama bin Laden 
had him assassinated the day before 9-11 attacks wow. uh, because he knew that uh, Masood had connections with the American CIA and different assets over here because we'd helped him with the Russians and bin Laden knew that he would be a liability. Uh, but those people hate the Taliban. The Mujahideen hate them. Yes. Um, and want to cut them down. And I didn't know that. That shit, a squad leader, that's me. That's my fuck up. I should have known those things mm -hmm. then. And it would have made, it would have helped me a lot. That's but a, I was too busy thing. partying. No, and not, you. Yeah. So, um, but those are big things. And, uh, you know, he got caught. He got caught in Kabul. And after 20 years of working with coalition forces from Australia to the United States, to different countries, we left him, they left him hanging out to dry in Kabul, where his information's in a bats and hide system that the Taliban now owns. And it took oh me, my God, that makes took me, me over a year. Yeah. yeah. Took me over a year. I, I, I went on Fox News to get help. I had perfect strangers and the intelligence community helped me. I had perfect stranger Marines that were retired in places that they could help me. And, 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 and help me, they did. And then he had the right connections inside his family uh, in Europe with the right amount of leverage and money or something to be able to get him out of there after 368 wow. days or something. Wow. Um, but for that whole year, he's sending me messages and showing me the Taliban taking ethnic Tajiks out and assassinating them and sending me pictures from the Mujahideen who are who are cutting the Taliban in half in Pashmir and, you know, keeping me in informed, telling me about all the Chinese troops he sees in Kabul uh, as soon as we're gone. Um, you know, things like that, making sure that I know for some reason that the CIA compound on Hamid. Karzai International Airport still to this day has never been touched by any Taliban or any force. Haven't broke a window, haven't busted a lock, haven't done anything. I find that wow. funny. That means something. It yeah. uh, means something to, for sure. Come on. Um, what it means is probably good for us as Americans <laughs> if they have that kind of reverence <laughs> and they're not fucking with it because either they know we're coming back or they just are afraid of the UAS threat that, that you know that our people have. Whatever it is, I'm, you know, it's good, I guess. So, um, but I got close with Cam and uh, and got him out, got him safe, and, and his city's still in turmoil, and he still has family there, um, and friends that are going through it, and so, um, I feel extremely it's very, bad it's for very a lot important. Of those guys that got caught up into that man, because a lot of them really helped us over there. Yeah, and what's that say, man? What's that say yeah. to the rest of the greater world and to our allies? You know, Thank you think you. a bunch of Terps are going to line up for the next war to help us out after Absolutely we just not. after we just cut these ones loose? Um, it was a very poor tactical decision. And I will say this from me and from the war fighters that that at least I represent and are like minded uh, to any interpreter out there that uh, that was cut up, cut loose and ran up the flagpole by the United States government. Believe me, that is not the warfighter ethos that we possess. Well, it's but, not, no, it oh, never, no. it never fucking will be. No. And it's oh, not no. okay with the American fighting man that our brothers that were there with us every step of the way, making sure that we came home to our families and we just say, ah, fuck it. I don't like it. It makes, it makes me, um, it makes me want to, it makes me very angry. It makes me almost sick to my stomach how angry it makes yeah. me because not only those people helped us deserve the promises that we made to them, but it fucked us yeah, in dude. the next one. Guaranteed, yeah. mm -hmm. mark my words, it fucked us in the next one. Yeah, yeah dude. Well, and from the sounds of it anyway, Ryan, like you had some good interpreters or had some good relationships with some of the Afghans that you were working with. Mm -hmm. we did me and nick did i can only speak for me and nick on that deployment we did and we still do with you know at least one of our interpreters and absolutely fuck it's it's one of them things man it's like okay cool you know i mean nick tells a story about you know his 50 jammed up on him his 50 cal jammed up on him and he was trying to get his rifle and then one of our interpreters is trying to hand him a fucking grenade, like just throw that, dude. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know dude. what I mean? Like, yeah, dude. Yeah, stone man. Down he's, a, he's, a, he's a G. But yeah, well, you, you start to think when you things. get older too. You start to sit back and think like these are fucking people too. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Like, like we, like as a Marine though, you don't do that. Like you demonize them. They're yeah. targets to you. They're insurgents. Yeah. They're Taliban. They're not Cameron Astana and they're not Zach and they're not tank. And they're not these, these John, they're, that's not, that's not what we think. It's no. what we should mm -hmm. fucking think. Yeah. It is. At least about the people that Absolutely. are helping us. You know what I'm saying? But we demonize that. But then when you get out, you start to realize, you know what? There's been a yep. lot of places. And people generally are almost the same. Most of the fucking people in Afghanistan aren't Urah Taliban. They're fucking killing no. it for us. They're not. No. No, they're just they're not. In a, between a rock and a hard place. Yep. Yeah. And time. they don't have the resources. And, and maybe they don't have the G2 upstairs between the ears. I don't know. But what I do hope is, I hope that it wasn't a 22-year campaign for naught. Thank I you. hope that in 22 years, even after the fuck ups, I hope that we ignited some kind of a spark in those young generation that felt freedom and got the taste of freedom for the first time. And hopefully one day that'll be fanned yeah, into a flame that they can, instead of running and, and throwing their babies into sea wire with their moms and grabbing onto our planes, maybe they can grab their sack and realize, no, our men need to stand the fuck up. Facts. Just like Ahmad, Ahmad yeah. Shah Massoud and his son and the Mujahideen, they need to Big get time. that back, or it will always be a proven yeah. ground for Big the time. for the Taliban and, and yep. bad people. Always. I, I love that we're talking about this right now because this is not talked about enough. We no. the American population don't know this side of the Afghans, and it it kind of fell on deaf ears when a lot of us came back telling them, and they kind of just. Unfortunately, they don't know that side of them and they just keep it in with with the Taliban. They're all Taliban. They're all this They're all that. It's not true. A lot of them over there really, really helped us. And they they mm -hmm. they hate the Taliban. They yeah, think they about want... think about what an ethnic Tajik believes. Iranian blood. Right. OK, so what do they believe? They believe Western uh, Western eyes. They believe that their women should be educated. They believe that they shouldn't yep. have to cover all of their skin they don't believe in sharia law they do believe that they should edu educate their kids past the third fourth fifth sixth grade they believe that and they want their people yeah. to be free and they're caught in a country that's ran by a bunch of uh lunatics let's extremists. call it yeah 100 extremists yeah. yeah and then so what do you do of course you hate them but you're still stuck if there's not enough people like you exactly and you have a an enemy that rules with an iron fist i mean yeah. and they do man they'll, they'll they burn you do. they'll drown you they'll rape you they'll pill they make they, examples man. that's what they do and they have to to rule those people and i think that it's easy to rule people that are one afraid and two don't uh, don't have their own thoughts they're uneducated it's very well, think easy about it dude we go in there for six months around. we leave and then they're left to to nothing you know like how are they even going to defend yeah. themselves i mean they, mm -hmm. you're right they don't have the ways or means to do it but right. at some point they got to make a they got to you know put a foot down and make a mujahideen again or some kind of group like that and stand i think up it's still them. rocking i think it's still in Pashmir. they've been ran out for the most part but there's still some I'm still getting stuff from over there, which is, I don't know how, which is kind of amazing, but um, it's not good. No. Just because we left, nothing got better. I can promise you no, that. Absolutely. Yeah, no shit. No but shit. I'm also of the, uh, I'm also of the opinion that like the $120 billion we've sent to Ukraine that everybody's bitching about, you want to know how many U.S. Sons of Liberty died in that fucking conflict so far? Zero. So fuck that money. It's tax money we already gave to the government and we needed to send old equipment out because we got new equipment coming in yeah, for the true. next one. So that's everybody true. on the conservative side that wants to bitch about the money that's going over there, all that money going over there is keeping American sons and daughters of liberty peaceful, sleeping, and at the fucking mall. I never thought so of it. Think like about that. that before we bitch about what we yeah. send over there. Yeah, I never thought of it like that, honestly. And I'm not saying you guys are bitching, but I hear no, a lot. No, of, no, no. I hear no. a lot of even like my yeah, conservative friends like, like, oh, fuck this. And it's like, well, did you think about it though? Like, did you really think about it? Because we haven't lost anybody. And it's money. What is that? What's money? We're the richest, po most powerful nation in the world anyway. So what? Nobody's dying in our, and no, none of our bloodlines ending yeah, over true. something stupid. And we're going to check one of the world superpowers. Yeah, it's a fact. It's a proxy war. Uh, proxy. Yeah. yeah, it's something, but it's not us dying. That's true. And it's not NATO getting fully involved yet. Yet. Yeah.
you know, yeah, yeah. I, it's a, I, I actually like hearing your your thoughts on this. I don't want to have to have you tell the same generic story that you've been telling, man. I like I like your your input on stuff like this, and you know, this is kind of a good road to go down because this stuff isn't talked enough. Do you think that it should be talked veterans. enough? Do you, I mean, do you think that do you think that the average war veteran from the last twenty years, military veteran, let's say, do you think they really care about Ukraine and Russia right now, or no? course not you don't no i don't see i do and it's so weird one of my mentors was hitting me up and he's like he's like hey why why are you even talking about this stuff you need to be talking to your people do you think your people want to hear about this and i'm like i want to hear about it so if they're like me probably unpack that a little bit why, why do you say that yeah cool. like what wh- which part like why why would you say that you care about uh the ukraine and well first of all what really is going on Ryan, you know, I mean, I only know, I only know what, what I think I know. And that comes from sources that I don't, you know what I mean? So it's like, you can only know so much, but Russia doesn't want the NATO alliance to have 1200 more miles of uh, land butting up against it. It loses the you know, when that happens, just like Finland, a couple of days ago, Finland comes in. That's 1,200 more miles of NATO yeah, ally so forces yeah. on your on your border. And um, Russia doesn't like that, clearly. But I think fr- from my information, like, like I can only I can only comment on the information that I have been given. And assuming that the information that I'm being given is correct, Russia is uh, taking a a beat down right now especially in the bakhmut area yeah donbass bakhmut is really bad um mariupol was very bad um there's still issues with the vvp uh power plant right now Mm. because the russians are being stupid in that area um and and continue attacking and and not letting workers get get where they need to get on time to make sure shit doesn't get unstable um but i think what you have is you have vladimir putin at the age of Low seventies. He's already exceeded, he's already exceeded the yeah. uh, average lifespan of a Russian in yeah. good health, male Russian, yeah. right? He knows that. He's a from birth KGB thug, uh, yeah. general. Something to take in consideration. <laughs> okay. Um, and he's vowed before his God and his people several times that he would restore the former soviet union so one has to surmise that he's at the end of his life he's trying to fulfill a promise and i think he thought he would be in kiev sacking the city and accepting definitely accepting you know uh terms in a matter of weeks and i don't think he counted on nato making the plans that nato made i don't think he counted on volodymyr Zelensky rising up in a stoic fashion and turning a million people out with guns and Molotov cocktails. I don't think that he thought that Volodymyr Zelensky would be able to harness NATO's power as quickly as he did. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I don't think that he's that stupid, bro. I don't think he's that. I, well, you got to consider, I mean, with his background, this is a very intelligent individual. Sure. I mean, it makes me feel like he's 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 like holding something back like he hasn't really put yeah, his guys keep, out there yet. people keep you know saying I mean? that but well fancy this the numbers that i'm getting are that casualty wise is somewhere around two hundred thousand plus maybe closer to two hundred and fifty thousand russian russian casualties they're saying of those casualties that it's like somewhere in the ballpark and I'm going to be generous and say 15,000 killed in action, but I've heard numbers all the way over 40 and 50 killed in action. Um, So when you think about that and it's like, Oh, where are you getting that information? Well, it doesn't matter where I'm getting it, but from people that can count boots on the ground. Right. And so when you're counting that, so that's weird to me. Um, It's weird to me how not weird to me, but if Russia was just killing it and none of those numbers are right, how did they get pushed all the way out from the Belarusian front on the north, all the way to Donbass, uh, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, that whole eastern flank is where they are. You're right. You're right. So if they were killing it, why? Why? How did they get pushed? That so wouldn't far be back happening. You're Russia? right. Yeah. Correct. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't. And so I think what you're going to find is. And this is going off of people that are instructing me. This is my no, of course, of course. This is my 
informed opinion. These aren't, you yeah, know. of course. But my informed opinion is that I think that I think 12 months or less, you're going to see the annexation of Crimea, which is going to either bring Seaburn and tactical yeah. nuclear weapons into the play. Wow. That's uh, which big, launch, well, which launches yeah. us into a world war because NATO will hit. Yeah, them, that's what right? I'm saying. But, but that's bad. Or. <laughs> Or he annexes Crimea back to Ukraine and Vladimir Putin comes to the table and accepts some kind of terms. Or, and and hopefully this is what would happen before all of that, I would hope that there's some sort of Operation Valkyrie going on for mm. the Russian people to take him take down, him out. either take oligarchs out. or generals. Yeah. There was a rumor going around that Navalny I would be that. broken out of prison. And, mm -hmm. and and I think that still could be viable because there's definitely fractures going on. That's These oligarchs and stuff, there's fractures. Now they've yeah, now they've come up with war crimes um against multiple soldiers and against you know Vladimir Putin, which I don't I don't see that shaking out really. Of course, I don't see can they really do trial, it? right? Oh, yeah, come on. Um but they've already definitely, gone this far. <laughs> yeah, but they can leverage that four hundred billion dollars that they froze up. That's true. That's, you I know, think of that. Yeah, and uh, and so and the big loser in all this is the is the people of Ukraine and, and Russia. Big time, big time. Um, but if you let if you let one of the near peer powers of the world invade a sovereign country. You think they're going to stop invading sovereign countries if no. it works? No, it'll be Lithuania no. and no. Finland and and Sweden and all of them. Do you do you and really believe Sweden, that though? I think, do you really believe I think that he, that was like something on his plate to do, or did you think he was just trying to get Ukraine back because Ukraine was like once there? Man, look at my show all the way back, Johnny Motherfucking Glenn too. I talked about this four or five days before he actually came across the border and invaded. Because one of my one of my boys was like, "No way, man! It's a it's a show of force. He's just it's a feint, man. He's just trying really? to bluff." And I said, "There's no way you do that with a hundred thousand people and that much equipment. That's too much money." I said it then. And four days later, he comes steaming across. Huh. And as far as his elite units, I asked about that to somebody that knows. And the very first unit that went in to take the air airfield north of Kiev was completely annihilated, and that was their airborne special forces. Was that Spetsnaz? I don't know what they call them, but it was mm -hmm. a special unit that was like their helicopter company, mm -hmm. probably or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And they got routed almost. I think all of them were killed, but there's wow. other reports that said some of them got out and, and made it back away from that. So I don't know. Um, what do you think about Wagner working for them? Wagner shot. You know what you got? What's his name? Poshenko. Yep. Or yes, yeah, I I can't remember what it is. Maybe it's the Y Something one. Like yeah, that. it doesn't matter. He um. The Wagner group's just like Blackwater, man. I can't even yeah. hate on them. You know, you get you get those guys that aren't regulated by UCMJ to go out there and do things that you can't, can't. do. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, and uh, but Wagner is is looking at 90 percent fa uh, fatality rate in, in Bakhmut in all of the battles that they've been in. They're they're sending human waves in essentially. And the way that they've got Wagner group plussed up was they've cleared out every uh russian prison essentially really? and they they have these guys forced signed on to a six-month tour wherein if they finish that six months uh they've earned their freedom for mother wow. russia uh that's wild and uh well they're not letting them make it though if they get close to six months they get shipped to a place like bakhmut oh we'll see you later see you later alligator yeah, yeah. so right. ryan like knowing what you know now and with your past and everything would you go back right now if if you got the phone call? Are you going back? You mean to fight? Yeah. No, I think that I'd be a, a uh, detriment to a squad at this point with the seizures and such. I think I would not do oh, anything yeah, but yeah. drag and pull people down. If you say, looking back on my life, would I go back and do it all again? I would do it a hundred times. I'd do it seizures be damned that was the best emotions and sensations and the closest relationships that i still have uh came under fire it's the brotherhood man um yeah the brotherhood of the warrior man yeah. when you and it doesn't yeah. matter what warrior you know it, the ones you're with obviously you're gonna have that bond but you can look at somebody in the eye and know that he's seen the same things that you've seen mm -hmm. and there's something that comes with that there's a um you know a uh 
I don't know you want to merge like an energy kind merger of, of the souls or yeah. you know a different frequency you know call it what you want to call it but it's something higher and I don't even know if it's higher good but it's something that only a small percentage of people you know like I had this talk on another show I'm not sure which one maybe a couple of them but like a lot of people think if you're in the marines who you de you're deploying you're you're all the time going and you're in war and if you're a marine infantryman oh my god you're going to be in the middle of it and it's just not true mm. yeah we're yeah. there but it's usually very seldom that you have a Fallujah 2 or an Operation Mashtarak, Marja, Sangin, Treknawa. These are four or five big fights that I can count in 20 years, mm -hmm. right? And so something that really struck me, um, it's a couple of years ago, I was uh, going up to DC to see one of my buddies be promoted. And I'm like, I'm going to stop over at the Marine Corps Museum and check it out. Well, when I got there, have you been to the Marine Corps Museum in Quantico? I have not. Okay, it's beautiful but they have they have the building is like reset down it's like a vault so like when you walk into it there's big concrete big beautiful flagpoles and then it goes down like this down into the building right well at the top of that they had um this traveling memorial is a it's a flat it's an american flag and it's in like bulletproof glass or whatever and it's it's like locked to the ground there's like they put locks on the ground to lock <laughs> it there and, and it moves they can unlock it and move it to other places. Super cool, but it's made of all the dog tags um, Damn, of, fa of all sick. fallen Marines since 2001 when we invaded. Wow. It's this big thing. And how many how many uh, Marines do you think dog tags are on there that were killed in action? I thought it's got to be close to 20,000. 2,000. It's 2,000. 2,000? Oh, think about that. Now, what does that mean? That means only 2,000 people. Damn, I overshot Lead that squads. One potentially led squads in situations like i was in or you were in Damn. only a small percentage of that were team leaders a small percentage of that were squad leaders okay and here's another theory i have on ptsd and i'm nobody what am i i'm nothing i'm not a doctor i'm not anything no put it out there bro however i think everybody suffers from killing you know their own species and and, and war is not cool but I think that people in positions of leadership suffer harder than people that were receiving orders. Um, I think the higher your responsibility level to a point, because then it starts going away again. It's kind of like when you get to platoon sergeant, you're with the guys and you're hitting all the way up till then. But you hit gunny, now you're company gunny, now you're going back away from the boys. So somewhere around there, if you're not in a special hitting unit like a, like a Raider Battalion or soft yeah. element, you're going back away, but up until I think like platoon commanders, platoon sergeants, squad leaders, and team leaders are probably the big four that suffer from PTSD. And I think it's that moral injury of, of making guilt on the battlefield that got people hurt or killed or made yeah, or whatever. Gotcha. Cause I could justify it if I said, but my sergeant told me to go here and I went here and then and such and such got hit. It's like, gotcha. okay. But for that team leader that told you to go there, he caused that guy to get hit gotcha. in his mind. And for that squad leader, he told that team leader to move. He had a little bit of percentage in that, right? So then I think that weighs on leaders um, more than just dealing with whatever uh, self-impacted PTSD maybe a junior guy may feel. And I'm, it's not taking anything away, and I could be completely full of shit. But I was able to heal from my personal um, stuff way faster than i was able to heal from getting some of my guys killed mm. if, if that's where i'm going so gotcha yeah no and yeah i mean especially like you know with me being a corpsman and everything and yeah dude like that's big i mean yeah because it is i mean fuck i mean losing the guy period no matter what is fucking horrible horrible but the worst being the fucking you know being the corpsman on uh, you know on that and you know me and nick we had some bad fucking nights on our deployment with that we were on together and mm -hmm. yeah dude it's just you're like fuck man like it, you and you can never explain that like i can explain it to you maybe you know i can explain it to nick maybe you know what i mean like who, who do you want to explain it to though who needs well, to know that well, That's true. I mean, dude, no, real question. Real question. Who would you want no, to explain no, that real, to that you would question. struggle explaining? 
No, that's a real question, man. And, uh, you know, just I, the answer I would maybe be, you're talking about the like answer a would be doctor like or something. something. If it's a doctor, that's one thing. But if it's like your wife, your kids, your family, people that just haven't been there, um, I would challenge you to dig deep and under and ask yourself, do they even need to know? Like, mm -hmm. if you could put it perfectly, do you even want them to know how that feels? Like, you know? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You got me, brother. And, and, me and, right and what if, absolutely. and what's it mean if they do know? Who gives a fuck? Yeah, it's true. True. Um, one of those and I'm not trying. I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm trying to help. No, no, no. Like, no, like, not at like all, it, it, it's not cool if people can empathize and sympathize, and they can come watch these things and get a little bit of taste of what people go through. But at the end of the day, I don't care if you empathize with me. I don't care if you believe what I'm saying. I don't care if you believe all these other veterans. I was there. These guys were there. We share something special that we know is real. And so I don't give a fuck if you think it's real, know it's real, hear it's real. I want you to care about it. Um, but if you don't want to care about it or if uh, or if I just can't explain it to you, that's no sweat off my sack. No man. screw. Yeah, exactly. you, you don't. Yeah, you don't. So yeah, what? Thank right. God you can't understand it because it's the shit that keeps grown men up sometimes. So maybe you shouldn't understand it. Damn. So I, I see you, you kind of have those. You dig deep with a lot of things, man. You have a lot of those hard conversations people don't like to have. Um I see that in a lot of things that you say, because a lot of people can't go past a certain point, man. They don't want to talk about certain things. They don't want to look at themselves and, and be like, oh, maybe this is wrong. Maybe I, I shouldn't do this. You really dig past a lot of those things. And I see you, man. And I, 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 I've been there a lot of times. I've had to look at myself and I've had to be like, you know, why the fuck do you even care about that? Or why the fuck this? Why the f You know, a lot of people are ignorant to that. And um, that's big of you. Um, I'm pretty intelligent it. more so, but um, I, I have a hard question for you, bro. Um, something I call trauma bonds. Um, after those three, four days, five days of banging it out with the Taliban, bro, and you, you know, hit that cigarette and you talk to your boy, what is it like just seeing their faces and just looking at each other? I mean, there's a feeling that you feel after you bang it out for a little bit. and Maybe you stitch some guys up. Maybe you put a couple guys down. But when you see your boys afterwards and you just there's that moment of silence where you hit that cigarette and you just look at each other like, fuck, you, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm just the wrong person to ask that. I, I loved it, man. When we I, I took cigars over in a little humidor and when we'd have a big fight, man, I pass out little acid Cuba Cuba study stubby. Love those. Like, Love like those. Tr treat it like a, like yeah, a celebration, man. bro. So it's like <laughs> for me, that's hard now. Um. Man, there's some when you when you're when you're the baddest bitch on the block and you are the the judge, jury, and executioner. There's something that comes with that. There's there's this invincibility that comes with it. And then when you get humbled, you realize that you still bleed. Uh, that comes with emotions, uh, for sure. Especially when it's your people that are bleeding. Um, but the Brotherhood of the Warrior, my hat says that I'm part of a a 501 C three uh, golf organization where it's all green berets and Rangers, Marines, EOD guys. And we golf every quarter together and called the brotherhood of the warrior. Right. Well, you hear about that, the brotherhood and you hear like band of brothers from, from the Pacific time frame, And you know, the different wars, you have the, these brands of brothers, you hear the brotherhood. And I never knew what that brotherhood was. I never knew what that brotherhood was till Marja and Marja was my fourth or fifth deployment. You'd think you'd know, right? Oh, you're a Marine. You've been to Iraq. You know what the Brotherhood is? No. No, nah, man, I was uh, disappointed the whole way, wondering what I've been hearing about this whole time. And it's mm. not that I didn't have good connections with my other Marines. Um, no, you're a real motherfucker. That's what it is. Well, it's just that a Brotherhood, when, when I think of Brotherhood, I think of, um, you know, it's that emotion or that sensation that says, hey, I got your back. I got your back. I got your back. And then somebody came up behind you and I fucking plugged them. Wow. Mm -hmm. Got your back. And then they did that for you. And then they did that every day for seven mm -hmm. months. That doesn't go away ever. Oh, yeah. It yeah. doesn't go away ever. It gives me cold chills talking about it because it's oh, an yeah. emotion. I tell a lot of people, if you could bottle that up like a Coca-Cola, there wouldn't be a price you couldn't charge for it. People get one taste of that and feel that, that security and that confidence uh, and yep. just knowing, just the yeah. knowing that you're going to be okay or everybody's going to be dead before you get mm -hmm. there. 
Like either we're all dying together, yeah, you just gave me or chills, we're gonna, or we're gonna make this fucking yeah, happen. dude. You got me, oh. you got me going. No, right but I know what you mean by that, dude. I heard the stories when I was a young marine, dude, and I was a fucking savage, dude. I'm telling you, I was. I did the damn thing. I was that motherfucker that punched your fucking ticket if I had to, straight mm-hmm. up. Uh, and I heard the stories. I got gassed up by a lot of people. And it's different when you're there. It's different when you got to pull that trigger. Because I've seen a lot of people freeze up when oh, yeah. push comes Happens. to shove. You know what I'm saying? I'm not knocking on them. No. You don't really know who you are until you're there. And uh, Natural for a lot of people. I didn't know it till I went on this deployment with him. And uh, it changed me significantly. And, and you're right. But you keep saying that you're the wrong person to ask. But I feel you when you say that, bro, because I, I lived in that. That was my moment to shine. That was that first time that all that training that I did actually came to an, an, a, a precipice. Uh, it, it, it finally, to me, it's like putting on my varsity jacket. That's mm-hmm. me proving myself right there. Mm-hmm. I remember this firefight we got into a significant one time. And uh, we were QRF, and uh, it was nighttime. And I remember being in Vic 1 behind the 50. And this was before I really plugged anybody, really like visibly put anybody down. And uh, I remember just looking at the sky and seeing the traces go back and forth. And I just, I don't know why I thought about my father, because I have a really back and forth relationship with my father. And mm. uh, a song just came in my head that we I used to listen to it as a young kid with him. And uh, I, what it was, was me accepting death. Mm. It was me just thinking about the person that I love the most and thought about like things that maybe I didn't do enough or what I should have done, but I got angry. I got angry that this person might take me out, but I kind of just accepted death behind. I don't know. I don't know if that makes any sense. I might uh, it does all. perfect sense. And Marja for yeah, me, and Marja for me, man, I, I had a prayer that I said every day after the first day, because after the first day, I didn't think I was coming home. No way. No fucking chance. Um, and it was just like, I would pray for a quick death, like blow me up or let me, let me catch a sniper round, like a seven, six to the face, you know, whatever. But what I, what I prayed for was it to be quick because I didn't want to be the bitch on the battlefield, slowing my Marines down. Right. Mm. And that was a, that's, that's a fucking hard thing to level with yourself and with yeah, your God, is. man. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, and, and I prayed that shit every day, just make it be quick because I ain't going to go out like a bitch. And mm-hmm. I don't even want to have that thought go in my mind. And then, um, and then I just kind of accepted, okay, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll say my prayers every night. I'll get right with the man. And then I'm going to go out and war my ass off tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did that and doing that, it made me such a, a more dangerous element. Um, because I didn't care to go, I'll go out and draw fire with, mm-hmm. you know, a flag on my back. Yeah. Fuck you. Uh, cause I've already accepted it. And then I've ID'd you and now I'm dropping mortars on your compound mm-hmm. kind of thing. Right. Um, yeah. or somebody, somebody from my group no, is going to be doing it. You know? So, so it makes you different. And I think that fucks a lot of guys too, though. I think that was a big part of me is that, or for my struggle personally, I believe that over there I made it right. And I didn't plan on coming home. I checked out of home. Home wasn't a thing anymore. This was the thing. It was the only mm-hmm. thing. And then I fucking made it through it. And didn't just make it through it, thrive the fuck through it. Yeah. Um, I knew about three months in, there was no fucking way they were going to touch me. Uh-huh. They weren't going to touch me. They weren't going to touch no more of my guys. They got the ones that they could get and that changed us and they weren't getting any more. And, um, but I still operated under the assumption I wasn't going home until I left. And, and that, uh, man, I don't think your mind knows how to fucking unpack that when you land. Yeah, I know. Because no. it no. bought all in that you weren't making it, and then you made it, and then you I come think home. That's and why it's I struggle like, now, bro. That yeah, right then there. you then you come home, and it's like your mind checked into the rest of its life. It was going to bang it out all the way to the end, and that's what it was going to be. It didn't want to talk about taxes and paying fucking bills, and and it didn't want to talk about sleepovers and, and moves from houses, and it didn't want to talk about watching your buddies kill themselves at the cyclic rate. It didn't talk about any of that, and it wasn't ready for any of that. It was ready to get the fucking thing on and 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 you know go out on the Valkyrie wings. That's what it wanted to do. You just hit the and nail then, on the head, bro. And then you come home and you sit in this stuck point in transition. And yeah. I think a lot of guys stay stuck until they realize, hey, it's not over. That was just a fucking part at the beginning. 
there's so much more yeah. left to do. And until you make that realization, it's hard for guys to get fired back up. But I think it's a mm. problem that we that derives from accepting that you're not coming out so that you can be better for your dudes. And then you come out. And I just think it takes the mind a minute to realize, hey, yeah. you're okay. It's Walmart, dog. It's not the bazaar. Right? Because that's natural. That's where fucking people got killed before. That's what it knows. And my my idea is that so you have your genetic strand and then you have your epigenetic strand that's your experiences that wraps that. And I think that if you spend 10 years banging it out in Afghanistan and Iraq or 15 years, that's 15 years of epigenetic strands wrapping you saying the bazaar and Walmart are dangerous and that crowded places get people killed at the cyclic rate and that your buddies don't come home. That's 10 years that you're going to have to undo that to say Walmart's okay and your buddies are all right and you're right here and it's okay to go back to work. I believe yeah. that it takes as long as you wrap that epigenetic strand to unwrap that genetic, mm -hmm. that epigenetic strand. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, I'm not a scientist. This is just these are my thoughts of looking at this problem for the last decade. How did you get like this, bro? It, I got I, blown up. I really think it's because I got blown up. Have you ever heard of savant <laughs> syndrome? Explain it to me, please. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Well, it would take way. There's okay. So the, I don't know how many there are currently on the earth, but there's like these people uh, that are savants. Like they were never think a certain way or you know, like one of them never painted in his life and he got in a bar fight and somebody oh, busted I do know a, 40, what you're a 40 a 40 over the back of his head and, and gave him a tbi but yep. turns out that it unlocked some portion of his brain that wasn't being used and they call them <laughs> savant look it up man there's a lot to no i know what you're talking about and, and i don't even I know enough but i said that kind of tongue-in-cheek but i was never a real good student as far as like straight A's, I was like a BC student, you know, at best in high school. Um, I always felt like I thought out of outside the box a little bit and I could do that and was confident about myself. But as far as, you know, being philosophical and getting deep, all that shit happened after I got blown up, huh. all of it. And I'm not saying it was the explosion, but maybe it was getting stuck and realizing, hey, you got to do something else with your life. Yeah. And then I went back to yeah. school and I think college helped me a lot. I've seen a lot of different points of view and perspectives, and I try to remain open-minded about that mm. to an extent mm. um, because uh, university is a liberal-ass place to be. Yeah, no shit. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I'm also very much set in my ways, man. I, I, I did go to my... I did, I did go to the ultimate arena, and I proved myself, and I don't have nothing to prove to nobody. So everything that I do now is to help my community be better and more lethal and help my community transition after they've done that. And I don't make money. Do I don't care about money. It's not what I'm not money motivated. Um, and I think that helps me because I just don't give a shit. If I sit here and read uh, a book about philosophy and, you know, for six straight hours, then I'll do that. If that's where my answers are that I'm looking for. Right. So yeah. I just stopped relying on everybody to tell me anything. And I started researching everything that I wanted to know about. And then it became, now I got this podcast and people like it. So when I call experts, sometimes they come on and they tell me, you know, all the things that I need to hear, uh, which in turn tells it to the community. So, um, look, man, I'm no genius. I just, I, I like to live, um, kind of like in the stoic realm. I'm a big fan of Ryan holiday, Marcus Aurelius, mm -hmm. Seneca, um, all of the greats, all of the old greats. And I, that's what I read. And I don't read that because I'm some higher than, you know, holier than thou art stoic. I'm not. Uh, yeah. I, would, I would argue that I'm really far from that. But I enjoy that lifestyle. I enjoy their pillars. I, I hold people high in my mind that are like that as well because it gotcha. seems to be the people that impact me the most. Gotcha. So I, don't, I guess I kind of went around the woods to get to that. But. <laughs> Guy, yeah. you're all good, brother. You're all good. Damn, I really like how that conversation went right there. I, I haven't had that conversation for a while. It felt it felt good just putting it out there like that. I appreciate that, man. Uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah. Other than that, man. I mean, I know you had a really fucking kinetic deployment, dude. Coming home sucks. However you you put it, I don't I don't know if it's you're not ready for it. I don't know if you're all just fucked up in your head, but what was the what was the thing that kind of put you back on track would it, would it say just finding a purpose just finding going back to school and purpose is back in purpose is big um 
but no man my wife is is probably a lot a lot to thank or to blame <laughs> for the way i am um I, I have an amazing woman in my life i've you know i'm a combat guy and that's not easy on the on the on the female of course especially yeah. when the you know her first deployment with me was marja that was oh, her shit. that was her introductory gotcha. class to <laughs> combat life right and um you know, she fell in love with me. We got married. I deployed to Margin. I came home and she had to fall in love with me again because I was yeah. not the same person. And that took time and that was hard. Um, I came home and I abused alcohol very hard. Um, we come from a culture of drinking. We were born in a bar, Tum Tavern, Ura, Ura. It's fucking stupid. <laughs> it's fucking stupid. And I don't care who I don't care who likes it and who doesn't like it. Alcohol is killing our people at the cyclic rate. Big facts. Um, and you know, I was told by some of the people in my command after we got home, if you're having problems, drink more, it'll go away. And like, that's the culture that we come Me from. Too. And it's like, yeah. that's not okay. It's not the way it's not right. And I would argue that pumping yourself full of SSRIs and, and, and different medications from big, big pharma. I I'm totally not for that either. I don't think mm -hmm. that's the way either. I think yeah. talking is the way for sure. I think talking is the way, um, Oh yeah. But I didn't do that in the beginning. I abused alcohol. I was, you know, probably, you know, way too much, but it became only work to me. Work was the only thing that mattered. Training was the only thing that mattered. And then I became, a, you know, an instructor over at ITB. So I got to do all of that that I wanted. And anytime I was home, I'd drink and go to sleep. Mm. Um, and I brought kid into the world like that. Damn. That's heavy. But, uh, but my wife finally was just like, hey, dude, enough's enough. And if you can't get right, this baby don't deserve this. And, she, and we're out. And uh, that, that was what changed me. I was like, what are you doing, dude? You're better than this. You know, if your dudes that you lost over there could see you acting like this with the family that they couldn't fucking have. What's that say? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I stopped, man. I quit drinking. Uh quit drinking and then when i quit drinking my life started getting better imagine that I quit drinking i quit the menial jobs i said you know there's more than this for me and i need to write this book and the only way to write this book right is to go back to school and oh by the way i want to publicly speak and address marines in the future so i'm going to take speech writing and speech drafting and public speaking at the college level and once i got into that school when I, once i did my associate's degree i was addicted i was I learning that, so bro. much shit that i never even thought about i was Seriously, i, was I can see you being great at that bro i was taking physics as electives <laughs> yeah that's how stupid it got with learning just because i was floored i was like and you're paying me to do this fucking bet Ate that and shit so up did my associates and then I got a bachelor's right afterwards in uh, Homeland Security and intelligence fusion. Um, and that was really good. I really enjoyed my bachelor's degree. My associate's degree is, you know, you're going to take the common classes that you need and everything's kind of laid out for you. But then when you get to that bachelor level and higher, you get to start picking exactly what you want to mm -hmm. focus on. And so I wrote my final in Homeland Security on Vladimir Putin no and the, pa the paper was called The Appeasement of Putin, um, talking about how for 20 years, Western powers have appeased him after he's chemically attacked people and annexed Crimea and took over in Georgia twice and Ukraine, you know, is the appeasement. And as long as we appease, did we not learn anything from Adolf Hitler? Hitler? Mm -hmm. When you appease and you appease and you appease and you appease, you end up in mm -hmm. a war Facts. and we don't fucking ever learn from our past, apparently. No, we don't. Or we don't um, care because it all just involves money. Or we don't care because we make yeah. that money from that green machine, exactly. baby. Exactly. What do you? I mean, knowing that you wrote a paper about Putin, man. What do you? What do you think of him? I mean, I think he's a very smart KGB old mother Russia operative. That what I told you is what I thought. Yeah, it's exactly what I think, and I don't think he cares by whose rules we play by. He's going to do what he wants to do. And that's okay. Like we've done a good job managing that for a while. And now we're managing it by purely sending money 
And yeah. we're not even really sending money. We're sending equipment that's worth money. Yeah, it's not money. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's equipment not money. that we're not going to use in the next war because it's out. I just learned that actually, dude. I thought we were actually sending so that's green dollar cool, bills. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Last and what question sucks for you. is it wouldn't be so fucking muddled if the left and the right didn't do the exact same thing to each other. Yeah, I know. Because then it leaves us, we the people in the middle, confused, wondering if how much yep. of theirs is a lie and how much of theirs is a lie. Or is there any truth in any of that's it? That's so true. That's so true. Yeah, absolutely. So that's yeah. why I don't fuck with politics, dude, because you can't tell. You can't tell, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, obviously. Well, that's um, the problem with politics. It recruits the wrong fucking people. Yeah. It definitely. used to recruit the brightest minds in the 20 to 30 year old uh, age group. And they used to be great men that built great big things and great machines. And we were the world the america country, yeah, was the absolutely and we're still there but but man if we no nah, dude we, we, we're 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 there nobody's gonna touch us i'm very confident of that but there's times that it seems like politics all it is is just huge companies lobbying people throwing money at them to push a narrative bro to push what yeah. they want yeah but Sad. what is war right yeah it's true our job is political people don't want to talk about that but the warfighter is just the furthest long arm of achieving yeah, a political right. objective. You're right. Mm -hmm. You can't differentiate or separate the two. So anytime we talk about war, we will talk about politics. And anytime we talk yeah. about politics, we'll highly likely talk about war. Mm. Well put. Right, so. Last question for you, bro. Um, what advice would you give someone like you, man, a junior that's going to fall in your footsteps, that's going to go through something similar? To what you did what would you tell him um i would tell him to read every single day about his occupation and there's millions of books out there that in some way shape or form will directly speak to leading leading yourself <laughs> leading small teams leading large teams being in combat what's it going to be like what are the physiological responses what region will i be going to and maybe i should learn a little bit about their culture Mm. there's all these things that I should have done and this. I'm not preaching because I did it. I'm preaching because I didn't. And I could have been way more lethal if I did. So if I, if I'm a young hitter right now coming up, here's the other thing I tell you, uh, when this all goes down, they're not giving you fucking time for a workup. They're not, mm. you will yeah, not right. get it. You're it right. will be the first unit that's combat ready is in the shoot. And I hope you're really yeah. combat ready. Yeah. I hope you really trained. Yeah. Because when yeah. we invaded yeah. Marja, when we invaded Marja, uh, within a week, I called a grid polar and shift fire mission on mortars. Uh, within two days, I marked targets and called in for high mar rockets, used A-10 warthogs, Israeli fast movers, and that's as a sergeant. And if you're not on that level, you should be on that level because that is the level that is expected of you. It's not U.S. Marines after a workup it's like you're a 911 force that says when russia fucks up tomorrow you leave in a day and if you're not ready you're just not going to be ready and not being ready is not okay because you'll be the one that makes it back your not readiness killed your buddy damn that's hard damn yeah. that was real right and there. your mistakes get zipped up in front of you Oof. and in, and until your mistakes got zipped up in front of you before you don't know the gravity of that Mistakes get zipped up in front of you. That's so read, train, pick the brains of your seniors. And if I'm if I'm you, it's something else somebody never told me. I'm finding a mentor. I'm finding somebody that mm. I want to emulate. And I'm saying, can you I'm not saying it passively. I'm going right to him going, Hey Sergeant Rogers, I really like, you know, the way you conduct yourself, and I know I could learn a lot from you. And I'm not trying to be a kiss ass, but I was told recently that I should have a mentor and it would help my career if I found a sound person to mentor me through some of, you know, the obstacles in life and in service. Would that be okay with you? And mm -hmm. then that sergeant should pause because if you're not 100% into mentoring somebody, you shouldn't do it. Yeah, exactly. But if you are, it will be one of the best relationships. Yeah, you help, right. you'll learn from mentoring other people. The people that you mentor Will then I always say that like um, if you're a good leader, the ripple effects in the pond from a good leader never end. They never end. Mm. They ripple forever because you're good and people want to emulate you and they want to they want to be that. So your protege and their protege and their protege. But one bad mm. leader hits the pond, boom, it hits and it splashes against everything. 
Mm. And then that, that ripple goes out, but no protégés come from it. Mm. And if they do, it's very little. And eventually the lifeblood of that leadership gone. But if you're one of the good ones and you imprint on one person, one thing, and he stays in and he imprints and he stays in, then when we're fighting wars 200 years from now, there's going to be specks of your leadership that are still rippling in that water. And that goes for everything. It's not just combat. You should be a good leader. If you mean to lead people, you should take that as a, wear that as a badge of honor that somebody's even letting you lead them. What does that mm. mean? Somebody's letting yeah. you lead them. And if you're an adult, there's another adult letting you lead them. So you should take that and you should foster yeah. that like you're yeah. leading somebody to the, to the future that we all want to have. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I go. That's hard. <laughs> Fuck well, yeah, brother. There you have it, everybody. That was that was a that was a heavy, heavy one right there, man. I gotta I gotta thank oh, you yeah. again for coming aboard. Yeah, absolutely, Sergeant man. Ryan Rogers, episode 66, hard to kill. Another one in the books. Lions of Marja. Go get it. Listen to this man. He's got a lot to say. And I think it'll be well worth your time. Once oh, again, yeah. thanks for coming on, brother. Semper Fi. Have a good night, my friend. Yeah, Semper Fi, man. Appreciate you guys. Keep up Bro. the good work. Bye, brother.